can see, obviously, our music is gone, so we're going to transition here from now from uh, awkward silence to scheduled silence. <laughs> so if you would uh, just uh, quiet your hearts. So Lord, may you uh, guide this time for your glory's sake. If you would uh, stand with me, and we want to begin our worship, a true worship hymn here, Ferris, Lord Jesus, that should be always the focus of our worship, number 117, 117, Ferris, Lord Jesus, and obviously we're going to do this without music accompaniment, so hopefully I won't mess this up, uh, 117, Ferris, Lord Jesus, we'll a few seconds to get there. 117. Paris, Lord Jesus, ruler of Shall 
shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes affright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us beat, a shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. cities uh, and some of the testimonies that they give they're, they're pretty uh, pretty heartening and you also have a letter from John Townsend and Celia Browns and then for those that would like to have some ideas on uh, voting uh, there's some recommendations here but uh, vote as the Lord puts that in your heart I'd like to remind you that uh, the service tonight uh, is going to be at uh, uh, Dan and Myrna's. John Townsend would bring the word there at uh, 6 o'clock. Craft night Monday night, tomorrow night at 6.30, Mater Hall. Uh, Tuesday, um, oh, let's see, wait a minute. I missed something. Oh, yes, also Monday uh, at 7 is the uh, prayer for Israel, and uh, Tim leads that. So uh, do come out and pray for the peace of Jerusalem with Tim and the group. And, uh, and then on uh, Tuesday, prayer meeting for everyone at 7 p.m. And then Sunday, the services at 9.30. Regarding Sunday, uh, there's nobody signed up for goodies for next Sunday. There's a break time in between Sunday school and church, so if anybody would like to sign up in the foyer, please do so. And uh, also prayer focus, uh, continue to pray for our country, federal, state, and local uh, government, that the Lord will bring somebody alongside to reveal himself to those in authority, that they might uh, 
realize that uh, he's the one with whom they have to do. Also, uh, our brethren around the world, the persecuted ones, our missionaries, uh, there's some on the wall, there's uh, 25 or 30 over there on the wall if you want to see their pictures. Otherwise, if you want to have a list, you can ask Scott. He has a list of all the missions that the chapel uh, supports on a monthly basis. Pray for the sick. Um, I'm here today because uh, Clint is home. He's, uh, we're going to start calling him Spider-Man because that spider bite that he had is acted up again. And so let's, let's pray for him that he might get rested and recoup from that. Also uh, on the list is Margie. I think she is recovering somewhat. Myrna, Sam and Betsy are here and they're getting good care. Okay. Uh, and you can see the others there. Uh, Sue's mom and Joey and Stella and Judy and so on that we need to pray. And then for uh, Jeanette and Tom with uh, cancer, uh, Rebecca and uh, Mike Johnson for those two. And college is winding down, high school is winding down, Sunday school is winding down another month or so, but the fair is winding up. So uh, if you'd like to be part of the fair, we have the last training session on Tuesday morning, this coming Tuesday morning at 10 in La Mesa at the CEF training facility there. So uh, do come at 10 o'clock. Uh, pray for our, loved, our unsaved loved ones also. Uh, the broadcast, uh, Tom and Sobrov's uh, broadcast, pray for, uh, for those that People will hear them in places where they can't go in public, but they'll, in the quietness of their own home, they might be touched by the, the word and be, be saved, ask the Lord to come in. Uh, Real Life Ministries and uh, Whitefields National Prayer, uh, National Pastors, we need to pray for them. Okay, is there any other announcements? Wait a minute. Wait, there's an anniversary here. in a couple of days. Ken and Vanessa. Well, it's what, 25, 27, 30? Huh? 25. 25. Right. Congratulations for you putting up with me. Okay. We need to. Uh, uh, do remember to pray for our missions and others that are in the, in the notice here. Yes, and uh, Sierra has a. I have a few announcements. One, my grandma Juanita is doing okay, but she does not want to refuse to move with us. And second of all, I got a job at Sea World, oh. so I start June fourth. Yay! Yay. Now she can take us to lunch. Yes. Scott. I have five Scott. tickets only. Twelve. Hey, Scott. Well, thanks for praying. Uh, had the meeting on Thursday. Uh, since I gave them several weeks notice of my questions and concerns, I was hoping that they would be prepared to uh, deal with those because they said that they would all be addressed. And they were sadly not prepared to answer my questions. So who knows <laughs> what's going on. So anyway, uh, so I, I did have a union rep there and says that uh, I can consult with the lawyer to maybe through the Freedom of Information Act to force them to respond to certain questions. So, so please be in prayer about that. Okay. Well, the incident season and now season always ready to give an answer to the whole of the So be faithful in schools. All right, if you would uh, stand with me and turn in your uh, hymn books to 304, 304, there is power in the blood, 304. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the 
blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's high. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. All right, if you would uh, remain standing, and our brother Scott will lead us in the best of our Yes, Father, we are so thankful that there is power in the blood, that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, Lord. We're just so thankful, Lord, for that, and and uh, we pray, Lord, for our leadership in our country, Lord, and world leaders as well, Lord, that they would recognize that they must give an account to you, Lord. We pray that they would search for your wisdom and, and not that of men, Lord, and that you would just uh, bring them to yourself. Uh, Lord, help us to remember to pray for them as you instruct in Scripture to pray for those that are our leaders. Lord, that uh, also you would be with persecuted brethren around the world, Lord, many who are suffering because of their belief in you, some that have even given their lives. Uh, Lord, we just pray for a good witness for them to those persecuting them, that they may be as Paul and Silas, that even those that are holding them captive, Lord, physically may turn to you. Lord, we just uh, pray for that, and also for Jeffrey Woodkey and his family. Amen. Uh, continue to pray, Lord, for our sick, that they might know your presence with them and your sufficient grace. Lord, and uh, we know that you are able to heal, but we know it is with the Apostle Paul that you don't always remove those thorns in the flesh, but nonetheless, your grace is sufficient. And we just pray, Lord, for your will to be done and just uh, help us to rejoice and be thankful in all things, even as we go through certain trials, Lord. We know that uh, it's to bring us forth as gold mm. as we go through these trials, Lord. And we just pray that you would help us, Lord, to, to be able to look to you during this time, knowing that you're with us as we go through all these trials. Continue to be, Lord, with our unsaved loved ones. Lord, that you would bring someone across their path to share with them the words of life. Lord, prepare their hearts mm. that it might fall on good ground and bring forth fruit, that they might have a godly sorrow that works repentance and salvation. Continue to bless the broadcasts that are going forth through Tom and Saurabh and Lord, the Summer uh, Blitz and the outreach through Tom's book and Lord, all the missionaries that we support that your word would go forth. We know it won't return void, but will uh, 
accomplish the purposes were unto it sent. And we pray, Lord, as your word goes forth that the sea of Story Castle, that there would be enough volunteers to get the word out. Lord, you would prepare those hearts even now uh, to receive the truth. And uh, Lord, that you would also be with the uh, volunteers for the, the uh, CEF Good News Clubs as well. Continue to bless uh, Real Life Ministries and Whitefields and all the missionaries we support, Lord, that they would just continue to be faithful and, and that you would add to the church daily such as should be saved. Now help us to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Amen. Lord, be with our, our brother who's bringing the message, Lord, and that you would just help us to listen with ready minds and not be distracted, that we would be focused on the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, that we would henceforth not live unto ourselves, but unto him who died for us and has risen again. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. And now, I believe we'll have special music. Brother Jose, beautiful music. Good morning to everyone. Glad to be here with you again and worshiping the Lord together. Could you please open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, the last chapter, chapter 24, verses 50 through 53, uh, the last and final paragraph of Gospel of Luke. Uh, we want us, I want us to study focus today on the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, you know, this Thursday is the ascension day, 40 days after Easter, and I'm saying that not because I want to become to be a traditionalist, uh, not at all, but because it's biblical, and it's mentioned in the Bible twice, at the end of the Gospel of Luke and in the beginning of the book of Acts. Um, <clears throat> The last thing that our Lord Jesus Christ did while he was here on earth was to disappear. Uh, 
<laughs> of course, after his resurrection, he appeared to more than 500 people, taught his disciples, gave them commission to go and spread the gospel, make disciples of all nations, of all people, baptizing them. But after all these things, the last thing that he did was to disappear. Now, in our own human reasoning, that was not the right thing to do. If we were there, we probably would tell him, don't do that, Lord. Why don't you just take a walk across the city of Jerusalem so that all those people who crucified you just 40 days ago would see that they failed and see you alive and come to faith in you. But no, that is not what he did. And as you know, we shouldn't be surprised because usually the Lord doesn't do what we think it's the right thing. He doesn't listen to advices. Uh, in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, we read, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts uh, than your thoughts. Now, uh, this doesn't mean that we cannot understand God's will in the scripture. It just means he uh, thinks and plans differently from us. So let's look at our text from Luke chapter 24, starting from verse 50. Uh, the word of God says, He led them out as far as Bethany, and He lifted up His hands, blessed them, and while He was blessing them, He parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping Him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple praising God. Amen. Let's have a prayer. Father God, we thank you for the great privilege of being here in your church, in your place of worship, and worshiping your blessed name, the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that we can be part of your family because of your grace and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now may you open the word for us, help us to understand it, and to put it into practice into our worlds, into our lives. Uh, we commit our time to your hand. Help me in bringing your word, for without you I can do nothing. And may your word uh, take deep root in our hearts and bring forth fruits of righteousness. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Now this is a brief account of the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ into heaven. Having completed his earthly mission, his earthly work and journey, it's a significant event, uh, maybe in some way far more significant than most people give it a credit for. Uh, you know, in all cultures, in all societies, we have a tradition of honoring the birth of famous people. We celebrate birthdays of famous people as a culture and as a society. Sometimes we even make national holiday out of birthdays of famous people, presidents, king, famous uh, influential figures, so forth. Now, we, we do that not because their birth was significant, no, uh, 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 no, their birth wasn't really significant, and when they were born they hadn't accomplished anything yet, nor could anything be guaranteed as to what the future might hold for them. Now there's only one person, only one person who ever lived whose accomplishment was, whose accomplishment were written long time before he was born and his birth was significant because it was a fulfillment of many, many prophecies and that one person is Jesus Christ. So while it makes sense to celebrate his birthday because it was already written and uh, what he would accomplish was already prophesied, it also makes equal sense to celebrate his ascension, which ended his earthly mission, earthly journey, not in debt, the way everybody else's earthly journey ends, but in simply transporting himself in full view of his followers into heaven. And again, I suggest that ascension of Christ doesn't get anywhere near attention that it should. 
We celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and rightly so, because of what we know He accomplished, though it was still in future at the time when He was born. And we remember His death on the cross, the Good Friday, and we celebrate His re resurrection, and rightly so. But unfortunately, His ascension, uh, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, is forgotten. Ascension of Christ should be also remembered and celebrated because when Jesus ascended into heaven, that was heaven's affirmation that he had accomplished everything he had come to do. So, uh, for at least this Sunday, we are going to focus our attention on his departure. Luke began his gospel with his arrival, and Luke ends with his departure. The story of Jesus began in heaven when he left and came to earth, and it ends when he leaves earth to return to heaven. The story began with condensation and ends with ascension. Began with incarnation and ends with exaltation. Began with expectation and end with consummation, fulfillment of everything that was promised. It began with the Son of God being born of a virgin, descending to earth, and it ends with the Son of God being raised from the dead, ascending to glory in heaven. The story began with the hope unrealized and ends with the hope fully realized. It began with a promise and ends with a fulfillment and a new promise. And the story began with praise and worship, and it ends with praise and worship. When you go through the Gospel of Luke, you come from the beginning to the end, and in between <clears throat> there is this incomparable, majestic history of his life. Jesus' life, his teaching, his miracle, his rejection, his death, his resurrection, a history written majestically by Luke, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and not only by Luke, but uh, by Luke, but also by Matthew, Mark, and John. However, only Luke is given, granted, this great privilege of recording the apex of all those events, the ascension of Christ. And Luke tells us about the ascension twice. It is how he ends his gospel with ascension, and it's how he begins his next volume, volume two of history, called the book of Acts. He begins with ascension. Luke tells the story of Christ on earth. Acts tells the story of coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, 10 days after ascension, uh, 50 days from Easter, and the beginning of the fulfillment of the Great Commission in the establishment of his church. So you can think of Gospel of Luke as his first volume and the book of Acts as his second volume. So Luke, again, in his two overlapping histories, he ends one with the ascension and he begins the other one with the ascension. Uh, the thing that connects the Gospel and the book of Acts is the ascension of Christ, which tells us about its importance. It is the end of one history and it's the beginning of another history. And as we look at this massive event, I want us to consider three things, three aspects. The event itself, the response, and then we will talk about its significance. Let's begin with the miraculous ascension in verses 50 and 51 of Luke 24. Now, we could wish we had little, more, little bit more uh, details here for such an amazing, staggering miracle, but we have a very simple and direct description. It says, he led them out as far as Bethany, he lifted up his hand and blessed them, and while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried into heaven. In a, a usual understated form of the biblical writers, Luke just describes something that is beyond comprehension with very simple language. In a 40-day period between the Lord's resurrection and his ascension based upon Luke chapter 24, the Lord did three things. 
He instructed his disciples out of the Old Testament as to what the Old Testament said that he fulfilled. He helped them to understand the truth of the kingdom of God. Then secondly, our Lord gave them and us the great, a great commission to go and preach the message of repentance and forgiveness of sin to all nations in his name, beginning in Jerusalem. And you know that's very significant that he commanded them to start from Jerusalem. Because usually with uh, false religions, false ideology, they come and tell you, you know, in such a far, a far away country, there was this great guy who did this thing and said this thing. But if the place is so far away from us that there is no way for us to uh, verify that. But Jesus said, no, go to that very city that just 40 days ago, they thought they killed me. And go and preach to them that, no, I am alive. Preach that I rose from the dead, I overcame the power of death, and I am alive. And preach the forgiveness of sin in my name, starting from the very city that they thought they were able to defeat me. Start right from there. And number three, the third thing that he did during that uh, 40 days period, he instructed them to remain in Jerusalem until they were clothed with the power from on high, referring to the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and the birth of the Church of Christ. Of course, he also affirmed that he was true, truly alive, physically, from the dead, with many convincing proof. All of these things were done over a period of 40 days. Now, with that, we can come to the next uh, we can come to the next part to our text and look at the marvelous miracle of ascension. When he had led them outside of Jerusalem as far as Bethany, and now Bethany is a suburb of Jerusalem, two miles east of Jerusalem, if you go out of the eastern gate of Jerusalem, you will see the Mount of Olives and just a little to the south and over the edge of the Mount of Olives, you will arrive in Bethany. It's a little village on the back slope of Mount Olives. It was a very familiar, familiar village for Jesus because he has stayed there often during his ministry because he had a number of friends there, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, their brother whom he had raised from the dead not just not long, long time ago, long, not long before this event. Now, it is interesting that he left this earth from the Mount of Olives, and the scripture tells us 480 years before the birth of Christ. If you go to the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 14, that it tells us that he will return on when he comes back for the second time he will return to this earth right there on the Mount of Olives Zechariah 14 verse 4 uh, 14 verse 4 says he will come back in his second coming uh, second coming to the Mount of Olives so this little hill on the back side of Jerusalem has a very very important place in God's plan and so he leads them out in the fulfillment of Zechariah 14, verse 4, because he's going to leave. Uh, and an angel in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, is going to come and say he's going to come back the same way he left. He left from here. He will come back right, from, right to this place. So you have to happen near Bethany at Mount of Olives because that's where he's going to come back. So he led them out as far as Bethany, and then he lifted up his hand, which would be a common gesture for people to make uh, when they want to offer blessing. He was lifting up his hand, he was pointing in the direction of the source of all blessing, heaven, God's throne. He's saying that all, I bless you for the blessing that comes from heaven. James 1 verse 17 tells us every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. And he lifted up his hands, pointing toward heaven, uh, pointing to the place where all the blessing descend, 
God's throne and he blessed them. This was in some kind of a symbolic gesture and it isn't that at all and it's not some kind of a mystical sign. When he blessed them, it simply means he pledged to them blessing from God's throne. Uh, um, it is the same thing as you, you read in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 when it says we have been blessed with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. He was just pointing to the place where these uh, blessings are coming from. So the last thing that Jesus did was a blessing. He had given them commission, responsibility, duty, but the final word is the word of blessing. What would he have said? Um, I wish we knew the detail, but we can imagine he most probably said everlasting grace is yours. Everlasting mercy is yours. Everlasting salvation is yours. Comfort is yours. Peace, everlasting peace is yours. I pledge to you my care, my love. I promise you all the things again that I have promised you, uh, promised you all along, along these past years. I'm going to heaven to fulfill the promises, all my promises to you. And they receive this blessing with gladness because all their questions were all, all of their questions were not answered. All their doubts and fears have vanished. All their fears are gone. There is no question left. They know who he is. They know he is alive from the dead. They know he had to die because they now understand. They have an accurate understanding of the Old Testament. They understand the kingdom because for 40 days he spoke to them about his death, resurrection, and about his kingdom. All its essence. They have had their final lessons and they get... Uh, the excellent teaching and now they understood everything they got it so they went from the depths of fear and doubts during the week of his passion to this most exhilarating moment 40 days later and they understood what the Lord is doing nothing left to say so while he was blessing them and you know, the, the structure of the sentence tells us that to, it took a time. Uh, it wasn't just a short blessing. It wasn't uh, He didn't just pronounce some kind of formula of blessing. In the process of repeating all the blessings uh, that are in him and he was giving them to those people, he parted from them and was carried off into heaven. We have in the Bible only uh, the case of Elijah, 2 King 2, 1, uh, 2 King 2, 11, when uh, he went to heaven without dying, and Enoch in Genesis 5, 24, went to heaven without dying. But apart from those two guys, it doesn't happen. Uh, but our Lord Jesus did die, but rose again with a glorified body. And he now has a glorified body, the likes of which the world has never seen. If you read the same event of ascension of Christ in verses 10 and 11 of, God, of the book of Acts, Luke's second volume, we read that as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, which indicate that they were watching as long as they could see him, two men in white clothing stood beside them, two angels. And they said to them, men of Galilee, Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? Why are you looking as if you're losing someone? No. This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way, in the, exactly the same location as you have watched him go into heaven. He went up physically and bodily, and that's exactly he will return. He will come back. He went up from Mount Olives, and that's where he will come back, uh, to the Mount of Olives. And when he comes back, every eye will see him. So, don't waste your time. Get to your work. Stop staring into the sky. Go and preach the gospel and serve the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and that's the angel's commission to you and me too he took his glorified humanity out of the grave he lived for 40 days with those who loved him as a glorified God man he then took his glorified body straight into heaven and that's why the heaven can now accommodate humans but humans only with glorified bodies so he went the work was done the work was complete and more importantly he had secured the complete faith and understanding of his followers that was crucial because now there is theirs is the responsibility to proclaim the gospel and if you were on the heavenly side what would have happened when he arrived into heaven well the scripture tells us he went to the right hand of god the father that's why that's the way the uh, describe the place of uh, that the right hand of God the Father is a place of association with God the highest most exalted place that God could give he sat down at the right hand of God Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says he sat down because his work was over he, he had accomplished his mission Hebrews even compares him to the Old Testament priests who never sat down because their work was never over but he having made purification for sins once for all sat down the only place we read that he's standing is when in the book of acts chapter 7 he is he wants to welcome the first martyr of the church stephen and stephen sees him in his vision that christ is standing and welcoming him into his presence the scriptures also says that when he took his place he was given a name which is above every name and the name is Lord and at that name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God God the Father Philippians 2 9 and 11 I always say that every knee will bow uh, every knee uh, shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord now you can do it here voluntarily <coughs> Uh, and with joy and gladness and when he returns you can enter his joy and gladness or you can be stubborn and yeah, you have you can do that you can be stubborn and refuse him and reject him but I assure you your knee shall bow and your tongue will confess that he is, he is the Lord but if you reject him when he comes back when you confess him that he is Lord you will do that as a defeated enemy before uh, a victorious Christ so do it now so that joyfully and gladly you will enter into his kingdom he is far above all rule all power all authority all dominion as Ephesians chapter 1 verse 21 tells us so if you were on the heavenly side what you would see it would be a coronation a coronation of Christ as we can see this coronation in more detail in the book of Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 through 14 530 years before Christ Daniel saw this vision in Daniel chapter 7 I was watching in the night vision and behold one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven this is when Jesus arrives at the heaven after his ascension he came to the ancient of days this is God the Father and they brought him near before him verse 14 then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people all nations languages should serve him do you serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom shall not be destroyed are you one of his subjects you can be by faithing him by committing your life to him now just a footnote before he left according to Matthew's account of the Great Commission Matthew 28 Jesus had said this behold I am with you always even to the end of this present age how could he say that if he's living how can he say I am with you always the answer is because he's going to send the Holy Spirit who is another comforter 
another comforter of the same kind as Jesus, same essence. That's why the Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Christ. And he said that back in Gospel of John, you remember in John 14, 15, and 16, he said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And he did that through the coming of the Holy Spirit, uh, who is the Spirit of God and takes up residence in us when we commit our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he came on the day of Pentecost. So we come then, we, look at, we looked at the, the event itself, so we come then to the response. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. How would you react? There could be no other way to react to the ascension of Christ than the way that they reacted. Why? Because they now understood everything. They understood the Old Testament. They understood every messianic reference in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and the holy writing. They understood who he was. They understood what he had done. They understood the necessity of his suffering in death as well as his triumph in resurrection and exaltation. They knew what the salvation that he had come to provide had been accomplished and the forgiveness of sin could be preached to the ends of the earth. They knew that everything the Bible prophesied about the Messiah, about his impact, about the world access to his salvation by grace through faith was not available, was not possible. They also knew that he had risen from the dead and that guaranteed them and us our own resurrection. They knew what a glorified, glorified body looked like because they had seen Jesus. They seen him with his glorified body. So they had some kind of knowledge of what their own experience would be in glory. So they did with what anybody who loves him does. They exploded in worship, informed worship, fully informed praise. All the dots are gone, all fears are gone, all the questions have been answered. And they know he is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior, the only Redeemer. And they are ready now to preach the gospel. If it costs them their lives, that's fine. Let it be so. And then this, after worshiping him, they return to Jerusalem with great joy. Not with fear, with great joy. Why did they go back to Jerusalem? Because in verse 49... When he had given them the commission, he said at the very end of verse 49, Stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high, referring to the Holy Spirit. And they did exactly what he told them to do. And this again is the perfect illustration of how pure, uh, true, how pure their worship is, how a true worship is. Uh, true worship always results in obedience to the Lord. It wasn't just praise, uh, but also it was an instant obedience. It wasn't reluctant obedience, oh, you know, we have to go back to Jerusalem, I don't want to do that, no. It was obedient with great joy. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy, to the same city that they had killed their Lord, and they wanted to kill them too. But now there is no more fear. There is no more sorrow. They worship and they obey. Verse 53. They were continually in the temple praising God. Same place that the, all the religious leaders were attacking Jesus. You couldn't stop them. You couldn't stop them. So now they are a formidable force. They are ready to go to the ends of the world. They are ready to die, and most of them they will, for the sheer joy of what they know now to be true. And their praise cannot be stopped, and they are, con uh, they are continually in the temple praising God. This book, the Gospel of Luke, began with Simon worshiping in the temple, and it ends with the disciples worshiping in the temple, praising in the temple. 
And finally, have you seen the event and the response? What's the significance? Let me just give you some things that we can think about them uh, quickly. Number one, ascension of Christ marked the completion of his salvation work. It marked the completion of his salvation work. After the cross and the resurrection, there was nothing more to do to provide any aspect, aspect of salvation. Of course, the coming of the Holy Spirit, but that was part of his ministry. That was summed up in the words on the cross when Jesus said, it is finished. The work of redemption is done. Number two, ascension of Jesus is the end of his limitation. He says in John 17 verse 5, to the God the Father, he says, take me back to the glory, O oh, Father, take me back to the glory that I had with you before the world began. While he was on earth, he set aside voluntarily the independent use of his, some of his divine authority and power to become a servant to the, to the Father. When that was over, he came back to his pre or not incarnate glory. No limitation. Number three, ascension marked his exaltation and his uh, heavenly coronation. It was then that God gave him the name above every name, the name Lord, and called all to bow down before him. Ascension signaled, number four, his sending of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16 verse 7 says, If I don't go, I cannot send the Holy Spirit. It is better for you, he said, that I go so that I can send the Helper, the Holy Spirit, who will be with you all time, and he shall be in you. Number five, his ascension marked the start of his preparation for our heavenly home. In John chapter 14, when they were all moaning and sorrowing over his living, he saw, he saw it completely differently. He said to them, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, God the Father, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may also be. He's preparing our heavenly home. Number six, the ascension mark the passing of the work of evangelism to his followers, to us. Yes, there is the finished work of Christ, that's a redemptive work, but the work of evangelism and mission only began, and he passed that responsibility to us. Number seven, the ascension signal our Lord's headship over his church. He who is named the Lord he, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21, who is far above all rule, power, dominion, and all authority is given, uh, all, all, all authority is given to him, he is the head over the church, which is his body. Ephesians 1, 21. He's exalted then to be the Lord and ruler of the church. And number eight, it marked, the ascension marked his triumph over Satan. 1 John chapter 3 verse, says, verse 8 uh, says he came to destroy the work of the devil and in his triumphant coronation the father was affirming that he had done that. That destruction, destruction of the work of Satan is full. The serpent head was crushed and Christ is supreme. You know, uh, situation for Satan is like when you cut the head of a snake, the body still keeps moving. It takes a while for the body to understand it has lost the head. And as for Satan too, yes, the head was crushed. The destruction, the damages that the Satan is doing in our time is because it takes a time for him to get it, that he has lost the battle. Number nine, the ascension marked the start of his high priestly work. He now ever lives to intercede for you and I. Book of Hebrews chapter 7, 25. He is our advocate before the Father. No matter what accusation are brought against us by Satan, 
and his emissary, he is our advocate. Christ is our advocate. And finally, number 10, the ascension of Christ guarantees and secures his second coming. Acts 1.11, he has been taken from you, but he will come back in a like manner as we have seen him go, and he will come at the same place, Mount of Olives. What an amazing event. Talk about something worth celebrating. If we can go all the way from birth of Christ in Gospel of Luke to ascension of Christ, from his arrival to his departure, we will get a picture of the whole thing. Yes, the words of Paul to Second Corinthians, to Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 is an excellent summary. In 2 Corinthians verse eight, chapter 8, verse 9, Paul writes, He who was rich became poor, divesting himself of all heavenly riches, that we through his poverty might be made rich. <coughs> Are you rich in Christ? Have you given your life to him? Commit yourself to him and serve his church. Serve his gospel. That's perfect. Father God, we thank you that this precious book, your uh, eternal word, your inspired, inerrant word, tells us about coronation, about uh, victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, tells us about how in victory he ascended into heaven, and we through faith in him can share in his victory. May we now, as he accomplished the work of redemption and has given us the responsibility of mission and evangelism, may we now go in his name and in his power and pro proclaim to everyone this message of forgiveness of sin in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we pray these things in mighty Jesus' name, in his blessed name. Amen. Amen. Stand with me and turn in your hymn books to number 919. Uh, we're hearing about our Lord Jesus has ascended, and we will meet him in the air. I'll fly away. 919. Some glad morning when this life is over.
above in heaven where you are seated, where you are beckoning us to uh, know that our citizenship is in heaven with you. Thank you, God, for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you.